Welcome back to our second draw along lecture on Milwaukee architecture following St. Josephat, which is the principal basilica on the south side of Milwaukee. It demonstrates the adherence to classical proportions, classical tendencies based on the need for the Polish community there to uh, align their <clears throat> masterpiece of religious architecture with St. Peter's in Rome. And that's the language of the bulk of American training in the 19th century was through a classical tradition emanating from the Ecole de Beaux-Arts in Paris. What we're going to draw this morning is um, part of the linchpin that moves from that 19th century culture into 20th century modern ideals. And Frank Lloyd Wright obviously is a big part of that as one of the four modern masters. What I'm showing on the screen here is the quintessential sense of how this modernism thought was brought about by Wright at his pinnacle prairie home, the Roby House, which I mentioned before on the south side there as part of that design art at the south side by Hyde Park, University of Chicago, where in 1907 and 8 he designs this lovely prairie home on 57th and Woodlawn. And um, that's obviously out of the reach of your travels when you visit Milwaukee and your upcoming trip to the conference. But it is a hallmark piece there. And it also is a hallmark piece of his career because during the process of construction here, he actually uh, went through a personal sort of travesty by electing to go to Europe with the wife of a client and leaving his family behind as he pursued more uh, dreams of an international career and more promise following his extraordinary 10 year period of prairie architecture. So he goes to Germany and develops the Wasmuth portfolio with Wasmuth the publisher to show the world the art and craft of Frank Lloyd Wright from that 10 year period from the first Prairie home of the Willits and Highland Park to the Roby house here. Uh, <clears throat> when he returns, he comes back and uh, because of that sort of um, personal situation he was in with now living outside of his family, He's not really allowed back in as an adulterer into the realm of Oak Park, where his home and studio used to be, because Oak Park, as the tradition says, is where the uh, saloons stop and the steeples start. To this day, it's still a dry town. And so Frank R. Wright was really sort of excommunicated from that life he had before he had left to go to Europe to kind of celebrate his career to date. But he comes back, he kind of rekindles his career and in 1909 heads up to Spring Green, where his family was from and had some land from his aunts. He starts to develop his masterpiece for his own home and residence at Taliesin. So if you look at the language of the Roby House at top, you can see this is a massive prairie ensemble on a hill that's some 90 feet above the Wisconsin River and the basin pond below. So this is, uh, for years, had been the Franklin Wright School of Architecture that had closed a couple of years ago. And now it's a, a tourist site um, for the state of Wisconsin, but also for the world now, because just like the Roby House, it also is a national, excuse me, an international world heritage site as of the uh, classification in 2019 for eight of his buildings. Four again are within that design arc between the Roby House and Taliesin. These are the pinnacles at the south end of that arc and at the north, sort of west end of it, as you kind of arc toward the middle of the state. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at what happens once he's in Taliesin in a project that's in Milwaukee, where there are six buildings on one block that Wright designed, and, and sort of a, a breaking out away from the tradition of having sort of one-off masterpieces for individual wealthy clients, and now targeting sort of the middle class and sort of building out for America. And that's the project we're going to draw as our third piece for the AIS convention coming up. <clears throat> so on the tick marks for the Burnham project, which is the street that's on the southwest side of Milwaukee, we'll find a series of residences, four duplexes, and then two more single family referred to as a college and a small house. They're all types of prototypes. So coming back, Wright is readjusting in terms of where his point of reference is away from the individual home to more of a global appeal to spread his ideas kind of across uh, the Midwest and eventually to the United States when he hits Usonia 
and thinks about a national standard for everybody in America and not just the wealthier. So what we're going to do here is find the tops of these, these four duplexes that are all side by side and the, the length that we're going to diminish here in perspective. And we're going to concentrate on the one that's closest to us here because they repeat. They flip back in terms of their orientation, but they are the same model repeated four times. <clears throat> so the promise here is the uh, American System Built Homes, and that was the title of the project, were designed in sort of a modest finish, just stuck all and keeping the cost down, between 1912 and 1916 upon its return from Europe and want to fulfill his interest, lifelong interest in affordable housing. So our first piece up here is gonna drive us down and show us where that right vanishing point is off the page to the left. And then the corner of the one we're gonna draw more detailed, you can see driving down here, and we'll stay on the page to show our left vanishing point. So we can take this edge over here, of the roof and the little tick mark for the underside of that eave up top and then find that all the way back here so it finally connects with this piece here and we can establish then our horizon line for the project that we're going to draw and basically our eye height is really at the sill of the base windows here so it's right about here because we're a couple steps down from the land that takes us up so we're a little bit lower than you normally have you stood next to the building so now we can draw on our horizon line and then all the way across, horizontal to the bottom of the piece of paper. So the left vanishing point, again, is over in this condition, stays in the page, and the right is off the page to the right. And that's our overall box, then, for the generation of this form, as it comes and breaks that base plane and has sort of a foot beyond it, and then the stone base, the concrete pour, establishes our box on the left there. So we begin to infill that, talking about this idea of packaged homes, prefabricated homes, the Estonian homes eventually, he back in the prairie days, he talked about a fireproof home for $5,000 because fires are an issue with sketchy electricity back in the day or oil burning lamps or early gas use so that to build a home out of concrete would make them fireproof. So White went down many paths to try to look at systems of architecture and not just the sort of one-off types. So what we'll do here is just sort of the complete, the, the array of boxes coming down here. And again, it's duplex, then you flip the plan, and these two duplex then sort of share a an entry court, and then it flips back for the next two. And then eventually down off the page here, there's a smaller cottage and small house. So at this point, it's sort of the end of the upper deck that en encompasses the little uh, walkway step out. So that's a three feet high on the second floor. And that'll carry right across these schemes heading off toward the right vanishing point. And we'll come and complete the box of our closest ASB duplex here and give a substantial thickness to the roof plane, which cantilevers over the second floor window area. And as it returns, we also see some thickness coming back to the left vanishing point, although it's obviously much thinner because it's diminishing, and then comes to the end of the home in the backyard and then returns to the right vanishing point. So to complete the lower box beneath that, that'll come to that corner and then drive down to its base. And we'll use that point to complete the box. The top of the second floor then has its casement windows, runs parallel. So all the parallel lines are going to use the same vanishing point coming down here to the right. So much like all of Wright's more orthogonal prairie homes, these are starting to move and tend towards a little more of the modern language where he loses the pitched roof and there's more planes in space and he's playing more at the Z axis. So then connecting these two are the actual entry pavilions that break out from the two sides of the flip planes here. And they have their little decks where you walk up to for the entry into that system that float in space. 
and then two large walls that kind of protect the public space where people enter into these two twin duplexes. Come down to the ground, and then we'll see for the first point over here, as we give that the wall thickness to these pieces, we'll actually see the stairs that'll take us up to the top. So again, the stairs, the treads are all horizontal, so they're all going to vanish, but they're going to go up diagonally. So from this point on, that's how they rise up and then come down to grade here. So we can put a series of seven-inch risers coming down here, and then come to the sort of the tableau or the terrace of the lawn up here. As I said before, our eye height is actually lower. It's not at the six-foot level in the house because we're standing on the sidewalk for the city, which is after this walkway coming out this way, it's still another three steps down. <clears throat> that makes our eye height a little bit lower relative to the home. So right about here, we see the top of that baseline. And then out front, he has a little planter for the lower level. And then stepping off from the base, he has a planter for the garden level. We'll build it out a little bit. And again, all the horizontal lines are simply going to relate to each other. So we'll kind of complete this one, its major pieces and components, and then we'll move on kind of replicating that, but we'll step away from the detail we get further away on the street. Okay, probably the next most important thing for us is to show the openings within the space. And so once you come up from this planter here, you're now up to a point where your lower level axis beneath the stair would get you into that floor level here. So right at this point, you have almost floor to ceiling casements running down and they're kind of centered off of this space. So a way to find the center of any box in space is to simply bisect it. And then when they cross, that's the center line we want to find so we can put the framing out of three equal size casements. And they'll rise up about midway through this block, this opening block here, here. And that'll rush back to the right vanishing point. Then there's a bit of a projected wall detail up top here. And then finally, the trim on that wall detail, and then the repeat of these windows up above. So three on top of three, the first floor living area, the second floor sleeping area. This trim will wrap around the corner, but it becomes fairly oblique as it rushes back toward that very close left vanishing point. So we'll have another set of windows at the first floor level. So if we come up to the height of the windows and then run back to the vanishing point, we can find the height of those ones on the side. And we'll see the same type of trim all compacted down to the series of lines very close together because of the foreshortening. And then trim on the underside, if we just look to articulate the way he articulated the, the treatment of the wood planes over the stucco. It's thicker at the edges. Nice flat panel up here. And sort of flat roof at the top for water runoff. And then what we'll do to kind of articulate the idea of pushing interior vines, which is so close to the space, we'd be able to see in inside the interiors. We'll come to the points where the room is actually behind the glazing here at these six points, which is critical. And we'll know that inside the box, there's also horizontal lines at the ceiling level, and they'll all vanish at the same point as well. So it's interior, exterior space, all horizontal lines have to vanish to this left point. So if we were here on the inside box of the space, this would cut back. It's behind the stucco now. We'd see a little bit of the roof line of the room here. In this case, we're going to see more because the the height of the first floor is over here on the inside of the box. 
coming back through here, through that glass, that glass, and that glass, we see the whole side wall, the interior. So we're going to treat the ceiling plane different than the wall plane in there to get us to look through the paper and into the building proper. Okay, then there's some decorative elements where he hasn't quite let go of the aspects of the art, art Nouveau and being more decorative with sort of non-descriptive techniques for adorning a building. And those step up toward that second tier there. And we'll give thickness to the actual casement windows and their structuring. Show that on the down part here. And then as you walk up, we'll show the vertical edge for all the stairs as they come down. And then right before we meet a landing, which takes you up to the second deck and then uh, into the apartment proper, we see the, the end of that one frontal wall coming off in this point that finishes that plane. And from there, projecting up, sort of a screen detail for some semi-privacy up here. And that's just slats of wood. And the end of the property for this particular home is right here where this comes over and creates a covered space, which again vanishes back to our left vanishing point. So duplex number one in the corner here retreats back with a nice organization of volumes and space, which are indoor outdoor spaces, so to speak, which then flip and repeat themselves. So the twin of that simply takes these back as well. And then by drawing a bit of this one, we'll see actually what the entry is like in the corner unit because we're gonna see the mirror image of it and we'll actually see the front door. <clears throat> So the base here comes down and meets, comes over to the left point, and then goes back towards the left point over here. That's going back to the right vanishing point. And then underneath their projected balcony here, which when the people access their stair, they come up here and then enter the apartment on the second floor up there. The first floor entry then is on this lower wall. So coming back in space here about this far over, we'll find the front door for both of these units on the first floor. So the public would access here, the privacy of the second floor access up above. And then it has the same type of base here up to a certain point that wraps around the structure. And then just beyond this wall, we have the start of its stairs. So it's parallel to this line which will come on the other side of that wall right about there and rise up. And that repeats that language coming down here. And then from there, coming off the left vanishing point, even more oblique is its walkway to the street. We can kind of show that part. One after it, you can see it's the same information, more condensed in space. And finally the fourth one, as we layer up the information, and then cut back to show that profile. Now, because it's the same information repeated, we don't have to spend time delineating all four the same way, but we do want to show the break of space between them. So more so on these, it's less about all the line work, but the most important line work then is the profile we see. So just on the edge of this, we'll show that spectacle, these planes in the space. And as they move down the street, we see a little bit more of the strength and power of the planes as they box out and run down. So it's ever here that is inferred by the viewer to say, well, that repeats itself down the street. So it remains less important for us to draw everything out. So those are three panels for that one, three more for this, three more for the fourth. Drop down on the underside of all the projecting boxes here. 
that shield and protect the first floor boxes underneath of natural light. And they're stopped at the same height all the way down the street. And they've got the projecting sort of garden bed, adjacent to the building and the ground beneath it. So now we return to our, our biggest aspect of making this a culture of three-dimensional aspects on a two-dimensional piece of paper, and that's by the use of the value. So the perspective has given us the form themselves and the size and relationship and shape. And I will simply say that the project faces due south on Burnham. So the sun rises in the east and sets over here in the west. What we want to do is light up the south side, but do it before noon, because if it comes to noon, then all of a sudden it's going to start to light up the west side too. And we want to have all the west aspects be um, in the shade aspect to pull the architecture off the paper here. So what we'll do first, here's the twin to that screen as well up front here, is we're going to come in and look at our main principal block and assign a value to all the western walls. So a quick wash to those sides of the project that aren't receiving light directly from the sun. And then obviously the underside of the eaves, which are also contrary in space to where the light's coming from. So that doesn't receive any light either. And wraps around the corner. And then because it's it's daylight, and you can see now it seems like we turned the light on, we'll come back to the major elements of interior space and know that in daylight, all interiors actually appear darker than the outside skin would. And we'll simply start by cloaking those a certain tone, and that helps. And then our west wall, of the stair hall taking us up and the underside in between the slats would be darker as well. We can then build up the bed a little bit and articulate the side of that little uh, garden structure that supports that. And then right assigns the value of the deeper tone between the stucco being brighter than the wood trim. And so the wood trim is up to the homeowners over the years to paint it what tone they want. And in the restoration process, the one that's been redeveloped in the corner here, that was the first one they worked on, as well as working on the cottage over here. Um, they're trying as a group, the people responsible for the site, to work them all up to the same quality and maybe someday open them up as sort of a a world-renowned site, Aaron B, where you can live in write homes when you visit Milwaukee. So we're going to come back into the idea of identifying the planes by showing that crisper notion of a tone for all the trim. So just to start with, we're going to go back over those lines and thicken them up and show the strength of the types of pre-cut boards. And that's the system that Arthur Richards and Wright uh, agreed upon here is that it's not really a prefab home, but the um, no parts were actually constructed off site, but the lumber was all cut at the factory. So there's no cuts needed on site. So it makes for quicker construction and it would fit together cleaner and better because the, you can work under the construction process of the, of the factory. Packaged with all the other components and delivered to the work for construction to pre-approved contractors who know how to build these homes. So the idea was this would take off and build out middle America. Here's the lip of the second floor edge. And it's simply just like a prairie home. The trim goes and uses its oriental Japanese influence, Eastern culture, of how it's used. And then all the way up to the eave itself, that's a darker tone than even the underside. So we'll, we'll come back and use more definitive values at, at a later point in the sketch here. And the trim for the windows over here. And there's a base that sits on top of the, the 
deck below. And then the stairs are also a darker tone compared to, we'll leave a little bit of light between the darks here to show light hitting the actual tread itself. Very down, the side framing of that part of the screen and the front fascia board at that point. Now we'll take that same type of spirit of this because it's identical here. We'll flip it over. We're not going to do it's quite much pressure on the pencil and a little bit less the information in the detail. So simply wrapping around the home then. Wrap around there and just a little hint at that one. And more most importantly here is to come to the corner and make sure that we are wrapping around onto. the western side of the house proper. And then underside. And since this curled around under the whole side of the building, this whole other side is probably one of the darkest areas as it goes back between the two spaces. And here's our door, which might have a screen on it now. So we'll see a darker tone within that door opening. And then a walkway will come out for people to move from the base of the stair toward the inner court to have access toward the rear. And then between the different elements of concrete coming out the deck, we've got a darker tone for the grass, which takes us out to the public area of the street in the front here. So we'll use that as a base to set the drawing down a bit to make sure there's a heavy dark at the base of our sketch. We'll curl that around to the back, all the way to the horizon line where that grass then would stop. And we'll run off that point to this corner is a way for the front stucco to play off the dark of the grass. Step a little bit here. You can see how it's starting to sip the buildings down on the street proper. And now as we make our way down here, we'll bring some of the detail of the windows down into the second duplex over here. So we want to pull a little bit of depth in the three zones of a darker tone. Again, it comes sketchier, maybe simple lines there, and then distance. We want to use the dark side of the third one down and the fourth to, to pull them away from the one they're adjacent to. But as the sketch goes back again, it's redundant information so this can drift off. Because actually, if you're behind the lens of the camera that took this picture, or you're looking at this corner piece, and your eyes are looking here, your peripheral view, if you look at this now, you can't see the detail down on the right part of the sketch. So that's how you want to draw, too, is that you claim attention to what the eyes can see, but outside that 60-degree cone of view that you're allowed to draw from, the rest is just sort of grays and little blobs of shape in the distance. <clears throat> okay, we'll do a little of the neighborhood to show the, uh, the treed area around here, the trees that might have been there from 1916 and those planted since. So we'll do one in the foreground here, which is kind of on the south edge of the street and hangs over into the yard. And we'll pull the trunk down right at the edge of our sketch over here. down the grade. And at that height, as a full mature tree, we then know in the distance, that same height tree will be more uh, diminutive. So the same scale tree behind the buildings 
would look maybe more like that in height, but it's the same size as this. It's just it's further away from us on the site. The same is true over here. That same tree coming at this point would probably rise up to about this height and then drop down to the backyard. And then we use those values to kind of put it in its condition of being in a neighborhood of a treat area and other residential aspects too. So we can take that value right up to the edge of the home because of the, the dark quality of the leaves compared to most architecture being lit up by the sun. And show the bottom edge of that, and then maybe the whole trunk of this tree coming down to grade. So now we sort of articulate all the perspective and found our two vanishing points, which dominate our initial tones of value as we push from the 0% of the paper to probably, we're probably at 40% here of pure black in terms of pressure. So now we want to simply do the drawing again in less time using more pressure on the pencil point to get more of an established range of values here. So what we'll do is come back into all the key areas and say, where are the points of reference where we're turning the volume around and holding space? So for instance, this line here at the corner is an important line, but really doesn't exist as a line. It exists that this dark edge is darker than the front edge of the material. So we draw it darkest in the plane coming up to meet that area, and that helps that corner turn. The underside here is dark, and that line is strengthened because it holds space behind it, just like the top does, to be more in a contrast with the bright sky in the distance. So that line becomes darker than others that we've drawn so far. Same is true as the trim comes across. It's a dark plane here, and then hits the projection of the sky beyond it, so that's darker. We've got the underside of that piece. So we build that up because that's our hat where we want the vision and eye of the sketch to kind of stop abruptly. And then this detail, this piece up here that projects out has got a strength to it, just like the side aspects over on both edges here. So as they turn the corner, we want to make those edges crisp. And now this one is going to be an important line in space, but it's really because of the dark space in the stairwell adjacent to it. So we'll draw the line in strong to start with, all the way down to here, to make sure we turn that corner. But then the space is going to turn it into a value of a plane behind it. So we want that dark to work right up to that point. And that way we, we, we see the depth between the projection of the volume towards us and then the stair moving up. Stairs are always nice in perspective because they, they tend to have people instantly move from one space to another in a diagonal. So whenever you get a chance to draw stairs, draw some of them at least just to have that sense of movement. Okay, then we'll come back into uh, some of the details of the windows again. So the edge of the underside of the trim is typically darker because it's going to be part of a darker interior that's going to force its way down into the space. And probably the upper part of the interior room is going to be less lit than the walls themselves, so we can variate that top to bottom. Same is true here. We can start with a darker tone at the top, and we've got that edge on the walls of the interior that kind of create the sense of a wall of space in there. And so that takes that up to about 50 or 60% in tone. There's the side of that notch breaking down. Comes down and meets this one. And then the underside that projects out. And that wraps around and meets that part. Okay, this, this corner is, again, it, you draw it as a line. We're going to draw that a little bit stronger because it changes the direction of our eye looking across those planes. We don't want to leave it as a line. We want to wash that back into the body of that so that even though it's all in shade, the same level and the same color stucco over here, it appears darker next to the white edge and then becomes lighter gray toward the back. If you wash it all the same tone, you'd kind of lose the energy of this coming off the page by having the plane darker right at that key corner for us. And then all the way down to the ground, what'll happen here to also help it set down is 
the light's coming from the south from this direction down in the building. It'll hit the ground and then as long as it isn't, it's before noon, it's not going to eclipse and start lighting this space. So it's actually going to cast a shadow, which will come back on a diagonal off of there and then back to the vanishing point. So this whole area is actually a very dark, almost black, which helps sits the building down and then shows the backyard being mostly in shadow by this two and a half story building in the front. And that's a nice way to kind of seat the building down in perspective. Okay, then we come to the corner. We're kind of edged out there. We're going to repeat it over here, but again, twice as fast with half the amount of, of actual media here. So we want to have that edge against the sky on all of these coming over, but it's going to be a less powerful edge as we kind of move away in the distance. And that'll come down to here. Maybe a little there. Here's the edge of our most important part of the building we're actually working on. Here's the underside of that deck and the one projecting wall that comes out in front and the stairs that step down. We can also sort of set down what we've done with the, the concrete walks by keeping the construction joints following that right vanishing point and just kind of tick those out there. That helps set that down as a plane in the ground. And I think we've got enough already on the rest of these going down the way. It's a repetitive information. And now what we can do is throw a little bit of cast shadow from the big hanging eaves over the space. So if the sun's high enough, it'll come down from this corner and hit the skin of the building. So if we draw a line over here, that will create that cast shadow on that skin. If it was in the winter months, it'd be uh, taller up. If it's high summer sun, it would drop that shadow down. And that's sort of the uh, sustainable passive energy idea that Wright was working on all along to heat and cool the spaces throughout the year, depending on the season. So the same is true over here. That little shadow line will wash out that part. Again here, shadow line washes that out. And now we get sort of toward the, the close here where we're trying to look at where's the point we're going to move from 80 to 90 more to 100% kind of the dark up here and really kind of animate this interior. So one of the key aspects will be that this, the windows don't receive shadow because you can't throw a shadow onto a piece of glass if there's nothing to hold it. What it does do is reflects the underside of this. So that piece of dark can actually almost be darker than the shadow cast because it's reflecting the dark underside of that cast area. So that's important. And then the edge of those windows that hold space, we're going to go a little bit darker because those are the closest windows to us in this building. And we want to make sure that those perform well as glazed areas. Same is true down here. We might assume that this lower piece here the underside is going to cast a shadow there so we can come in and do a little bit of a darker that shows the reflective underside. And then maybe we hint back to that top of the, of the window line in there, but there might be another cabinet or window on this blank wall on the inside. So we can sort of vary it by simply putting in some more information that's just kind of abstract that shows a change in a pattern. Maybe there's furniture against the window there, but it kind of gives the idea of activity within that space. So we're allowed to kind of have some artistic license just by projecting some movement of idea over there. And we'll come to the edge of those plates of detail and strengthen those up. And then at the base, where whenever you plant and have an active garden out front, the floral aspect oftentimes, certainly the greenery, is a much darker aspect than the stucco would be adjacent to it. So we can kind of animate that with some type of, again, and it's in the subject, it's just sort of a secondary part that's going to add to the base here. And then infill some of it once you get your shapes articulated. And that depth of dark at that base also helps out. holding that unit of all this uh, masonry, this stucco land on the ground then. And when it comes in the ground, it again then hits 
and it also has a projection of a line which kind of casts a little shadow here and over to this corner. And then right where it meets the ground, there probably is a darker line for the soils coming up and meeting the brightness of the stucco. So we'll highlight that base too. And then maybe come back in and do a little bit stronger green right in front of our subject matter. So it really holds that base down. We can thicken it up here because that shows the height of the lawn then off of the actual, gives us some depth. It's not sort of a carpet thickness. It's actually got three or four inches when it's longer. Come back into this door and show some animation behind it. Maybe get it's dark as dark as when you're up top of the stairs. You see the, the least amount of light in this whole complex outside. So we can go up the stair and then at that point, it's probably jet black. And it opens up when it's more airy up top, the top piece here. Let me come to this corner. And now in terms of the trees around us, the trees themselves are not planar. They're a big spherical piece so that the top third is going to cast shadow on the bottom third. So we can come back in and simply animate that as being darker next to the underside of our structure. So that can also go as a darker tone. So what the human eye is looking for is like, we like to see highlights and our eye in the sense is a muscle and likes to open and close and work. So when you close it down with the darker, open it up with the darker value, then close it down lighter value and have that happen from white to gray, to dark, to gray, to gray, to white, to black, to gray across the sketch. If that kind of animation, just as a graphic intrigues the human eye, there's an interest level to it. So the more you can kind of associate that because we started with the sketch and all we had was sort of middle grays. We end with a pronounced white, which now has that illusion of this white being struck by the sun seems brighter than the rest of the sky. And that's because of your media and what you've done with your tone here. So last couple of points here then is check all the edges again to make sure they're crisp and really animated as if this back in 1916 when they were first built and they were sort of really shocking the world about a new avenue towards giving great housing stock for people to rent or to own on the southeast side of Milwaukee here. Now the downside to the story, and I guess we do a little bit more of the value right there at that crux and then some on the other side. The downside of the story is that World War I comes up. And maybe because this tree is probably the closest to us, we probably should a little bit detail of actual leaf work on its outside edge here as it kind of finalizes the sketch. So 1914 to 1919, and it's over. What happens, uh, the, the Doughboys, the Americans don't get involved till middle of the war, but they did get involved right away with access and supply to materials to all their allies on the continent. So in 1917, the building materials were diverted to the war effort, which stalled a lot of new home building, including the Wrights Project here. In the course of that agreement between Wright and Arthur Richards, um, they got dissatisfied with each other, right ended up suing them for non-payment for royalties and fees. And the whole project, the whole idea kind of came to the end prematurely. So in, in point then, out of the whole system, it, it was the largest project that Wright ever drew. So for the, the uh, seven models you could choose from, there are numerous variations in terms of how they could be finished, the floor plans. 960 drawings for the whole set, the largest archive of drawings of Wright's project. So it really was a great massive idea. I think only 25 or so system built homes were constructed. And there's about 15 to 18, they, they pop up sometimes where they've been massed over and changed, transformed so much. We lost what we knew we had. And now they're popping up again on the sort of Wright register in basically Wisconsin, Illinois, Indiana, and Iowa. So again, the name is the American System Built. It's an actual sort of building entity that has this new vision for architecture that's going to marry the culture of right, moving away from the prairie home as a one of a kind and getting more into the idea of solving the problem of housing for all, affordable housing, which is then met by his biggest stride in that uh, post-depression. So if you have a World War I followed by a depression within a generation, um, a lot of people are destitute for housing. So he strips even more down the culture of the prairie 
and then eventually embeds the Usonian typology. So that's the ASB buildings down on Burnham property. Uh, you'll have access to a tour for that as well. Enjoy Milwaukee.